Tonight, Keir Starmer says he'll do a better job than the Conservatives at levelling up, but he won't promise more money for cash-strapped councils. The Labour leader says the Tories failed to deliver for left-behind areas because Rishi Sunak strangled the projects at birth. But he tells our political editor Beth Rigby that councils shouldn't expect a lump sum if he wins the next election. Keir Starmer also gives his deputy leader, Angela Rayner, his backing over the row about whether she paid enough tax when she sold her council house. Thames Water Boss warns bills for its 16 million customers could have to rise by a massive 40%. Community Secretary Michael Gove says it's a disgrace. Does it prove that Margaret Thatcher's privatisation of the water industry has ultimately been a failure? And Keir Starmer says if Angela Rayner offers you one of her favourite drinks, don't accept it. It's a cocktail called Venom. Well, it is nearly the Easter weekend break, so we thought we'd check to see if he's right. Jackie Smith and Tim Montgomery are with us for the next hour, and yes, they have kindly agreed to join me with this very important cocktail research as well, the troopers that they are. It's Thursday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. Well, tonight we're talking levelling up. It was the flagship policy of Boris Johnson, who stormed to victory in 2019, promising to level up the country. And now Keir Starmer is taking his claim on the concept, telling Beth Rigby that Rishi Sunak strangled the idea at birth, but he wants to bring it back to life. And why wouldn't he put it at the heart of his pitch? The Conservatives showed previously that it was an election winner, a campaign slogan that says, you'll listen to people who feel they're being forgotten. Everyone agrees with the principle of levelling up, of opportunity for all. But I have got a question. What does levelling up actually mean? Devolution, social mobility, job opportunities, redeveloping high streets, improving transport links? All of that takes time, reform and money. The one thing that there won't be a lot of after the election. Levelling up is a great campaign slogan, but it is a damn hard thing to actually pull off. Perhaps it's no wonder no one has quite managed it yet. Well, we can talk now to our political editor, Beth Rigby, who is back from Dudley in the West Midlands, where you've been talking to Keir Starmer. I thought it was interesting in the interview that he did with you, that we'll hear in a moment, he was keen to emphasise that there isn't a magic money tree. Yeah, Sophie, it was a really interesting day because while he is telling the country he's all about change, what is beginning to emerge is the change he's talking about is political power changing from one party to another. But in terms of change for the country, the messaging we are now increasingly seeing from Labour is that change is going to take time. Mm. So when he was talking at the local election launch about uh, the Conservatives failing, that was his argument on levelling up, uh, his answer was devolution. But there are pressing problems proper financing problems for councils at the moment. The Local Government Association estimate that £4 billion is needed as an emergency cash injection into councils now just to keep basic services going. We've seen Birmingham go effectively bust and many council leaders, one in five, saying that they might go... Uh, they're likely or fairly likely uh, to have these sorts of problems in the next 15 months. So the question is... OK, Keir Starmer, you're going to deva, de devolve power to, to local government and mayors and, and councils. Um, but what about the... What are you going to do now? How are you going to have this national renewal you talk about? And what emerged uh, both in the, in the press conference after his speech and then in the interview I did with him after was this acknowledgement that it's going to take some time. So he was clear, he said there's no magic money tea. He told me he couldn't turn on the spending taps. When I said to him, let's just be clear, are you talking about no cash injection into local government? He basically said, there is no cash injection. He then said, at the end of a Labour term, you will see an improvement in council services. And what's that telling us? Labour are now clearly signalling to the electorate the vote for change is a change of power, mm. but it's not necessarily a change in the fortunes of the country because they have made decisions, as you talked to him about in your interview you did a couple of weeks ago, about tax and spending. I said to him, well, are you going to tax people? And we said, no, I'm not going 
to do that. So what we're seeing now is not just the contours of the change message in terms of uh, the local elections and this idea of national renewal and the, the locals will be a test case, but you know the, the admission that in a way change means patience and I think that that is going to be a much bigger uh, theme and discussion as we go in to a general election. But I think we've got some of this interview, so let's have a listen. I think Rishi Sunak strangled levelling up at birth because he wouldn't put the funding behind it. Um, and we know what the consequences are. But look, I mean, the idea of um, levelling up in the sense of uh, getting rid of the inequalities we see across the regions, that's been around for years and years and years. But if we're really going to make a difference, we desperately do need to make a difference, um, then that requires a viable plan and it requires someone to put in the hard yards. You do admire Johnson's effort, even if the Chancellor, well, the Prime Minister then Chancellor, as you said, strangled us at birth, in your view. I think the idea that... Um, the I'm trying to get you to say something nice about Boris Johnson. Well, look, You're look, not going to do it. Well, my frustration with him is I actually think the idea um, of levelling up that was put before the electorate in 2019 by Boris Johnson was right, I will say that. But what that requires, and this is where I get frustrated, is if you really believe that, and it matters, which is why I said in my speech, preying on people's hopes, people hoped, wanted to see that delivered. If you really believe that, I'm afraid you've got to roll your sleeves up, you've got to put a plan on the table, you've got to do the hard yards. And so what's unforgivable about Boris Johnson is having made that the focus, he then didn't do the hard yards of delivery. And, and that's why people feel even more let down. It's why today there's been a lot of talk about disillusion. That is created by that sense of something being offered that really matters to people. And but a Prime Minister in Boris Johnson who wasn't prepared or didn't have the wherewithal to and, see it through. And for you, you, you talk about uh, devolution as a way of kick-starting levelling up. But at the moment, basic council funding is yeah. what ne is needed. I just asked you earlier if you will guarantee that emergency funding shortfall, the Local Government Association estimates it's four billion that councils need in the next two years just to maintain basic services. You told me I can't pretend we can turn on the taps, the spending taps. That's a no. You're not going to commit that money. Well, I can't turn on the spending taps, but I do think your answer um, requires something fuller than that because I'm very concerned about councils of all political colours um, struggling as much as they are with their finances because, of course, people looking in will say, well, that's my services that may not be delivered. So there are things we can do. I think the funding settlement could be changed to a longer settlement. Very many council leaders will say that'll make a big difference. OK, if we can stabilise... Peeps, just, just, just hear me out, there's uh, two other bits. If we stabilise the economy, that will reduce inflation. That's been a big drag for councils. The other change that we can do straight away is no-fault evictions, which the government promised, hasn't delivered. That means lots of people who lose their accommodation then are a strain on councils who have to spend a lot of money. So what I can say, Beth, is the funding arrangement can change. We can reduce the strain on councils so they've got more cash available. And I will say this, that at the end of an incoming Labour government, councils will be better funded, more sustainable and able to deliver their services than they are now. That's five years away if you win the election. You said the end of an incoming Labour government. The first steps can be taken straight away. The Norfolk evictions, the three-year settlements, the joining up of the payments, the stability of the economy. But you know, I'm local asking you councils... about a cash injection. Yeah. Can you just... You're talking about three-year funding settlements. To the viewer at home, does that mean an upfront cash injection for councils that might be about to go bankrupt for viewers thinking, is my council tax bill about to go up by 20%, which is what's happened in Birmingham? What it means is not um, a lump sum cash injection, but it does mean reducing the burden on councils who are spending money on things like homelessness, spending money on interest rates, that we, and spending money um, inefficiently, we can do that straight away. But what you're putting to me is the central problem in politics at the moment, which is after 14 years, almost everything is broken, including our councils, but our NHS, um, our public services, our economy. It's a long list. To show you're on course, though, to win, you need to gain hundreds of councillors from the Conservatives and take the West Midlands, Teesside mayors and these locals, don't you? To show you're on course to win a general election. I remind myself that in 2019 we lost very, very badly. Uh, we had to change the party, learn the lessons, and to get even to a one or two seat majority in the, in the general election, uh, we have to have a bigger swing than Blair. We go into these local elections 
um, holding many of the seats that we're fighting for. So um, I'm not going to predict exactly how many we may or may not win. We go in humbly, knowing that we have to earn the votes locally between now and May the 2nd. And we will do that by putting forward our positive and, plan. And Keir Starmer, you were very forthright today in your defence of Angela Rayner over allegations she's failed to pay capital gains tax when she sold a house in 2015. Have you seen... You say you take her at the word. She says that she's had legal advice. Have you personally seen that legal advice? No, there's no need to. It's not appropriate for me to do so. My team has. Angela's team has. She's taken legal advice. She's answered no end of questions from the media on this. Um, and she's been very clear, should the authorities want any more information, she's more than happy to provide it Are for you... them. I have full confidence and full support in her. Are you... You're going out and defending her and you haven't actually seen the evidence yourself. Are you worried? Is that enough for you? Are you not worried that this could come back to bite you? No. I have faith in Angela Rayner's answers. She's answered so many times on this. I know she's taken legal advice. My team has looked at it. Her team's looked at it. There's no need for me personally uh, to look at it, nor is it appropriate to do so. Um, but I do think, standing back, it's a sign of how desperate the Tories have got that they want to make this the issue in a local election, which should be about their failure of delivery. OK, final question. Thames Water could be facing the risk of emergency renationalisation as the funding crisis deepens. Thames Water are saying bills might need to raise, rise by 40% uh, to pay for improvements. What should the government and regulator be doing and should they be prepared to spend billions bailing Thames Water out? I'm very concerned about this, as anybody who is a customer um, will be. Um, it's for the government in place at the moment to... Uh, look at this and make sure that Thames Water is viable and provides the water that people need. Obviously, if we are privileged enough to come into power, we'll have to look at this ourselves. I do think there's a wider question of the regulations in water being properly enforced, and I would have accountability to the top of these organisations. On questions like sewage, if a water company is involved in sewage discharges above the limits, then the bosses should not get a bonus, and I'm just very clear about that. Keir Starmer there talking to our political editor, Beth Rigby. We're going to have more on that water story uh, to come in the programme. But first, let's bring in our duo for the evening, shall we? The former Labour Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, and the Conservative commentator and founder of Conservative Home, Tim Montgomery. Great to have you uh, with us. Jackie, can you level up without spending any money? I think what you heard there from Keir Starmer is the approach that uh, Labour will religiously stick to between now and the general election. They think a bigger danger than not being willing to provide money for the immediate problems that councils face is being tarred by the Tories as somehow or another not caring about the public's money and being, and being profligate. It means that you face that type of difficult and challenging questioning. No, I mean, I think he did have a few sensible things to say about how longer-term spending settlements, removing some of the pressure that comes from people becoming homeless would support councils. It obviously, you know, in the end, will need more resource. But this is a, this is a Labour Party going into this general election lowering expectations and keeping as small a target as possible. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, Labour are incredibly disciplined at the minute, aren't they, when it comes to public spending? You can say, see that it does, as we saw with Keir Starmer and Beth Ruby there, as we see with many interviews with the Shadow Cabinet as well, it can lead to these testy interviews, but they're sticking to the line. Yeah. Well, they're extraordinarily disciplined in a way that the party I support isn't. You know, we've yeah. been in power for 14 years and we're beginning to show, like, we take power for granted, whereas Labour are hungry mm. and they're disciplined. But I think in a campaign, when these questions keep being asked, not just by, you know, smaller mm. political audiences, but by our general public tuning in on scale, I think, you know, there is a real sense out there that something is wrong with the public services. And not being able to say in return that we have something, you might be able to make a sacrifice, you might have to make a sacrifice, but we're going to put up tax to make this service in particular better funded. I think if Labour... There will be something that doesn't smell quite right to voters if there isn't a real proportionate response. If you say the public services are in the crisis that they are, well, then you've got to have some kind of big response to that. And at the moment, Labour are offering nothing else. And... That could be a voter mobilisation issue. It won't change the outcome in the next election, 
but it could mean that the current opinion polls flatter the Labour position. And that worked for New Labour, didn't it? You know, Gordon Brown talking about you know, national insurance to fund the NHS. I mean, there is a kind of... You know, yeah, although he didn't talk about that in the general election campaign in the run-up no. to 1997, if you no. remember. And yeah. I remember the sort of discipline that was imposed on us as candidates then. He specifically said we will stick to Conservative mm. Party spending plans for the first two years. There's a bit more growth but and money in the bank at that time, exactly. though, wasn't there? I mean, that is the problem. It was, you know, it felt quite austere, I have to mm. say, if you were having to repeat it at the time. But then it was a more benign economic environment to, to move into. Mm. Though this is not going to be an election that is going to be full of hope and joy and, um, you know, <laughs> no. uh, uh, offers of uh, large Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> It's going to be quite grim, I think. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, from my perspective, if what that then means is people feel able to trust Labour to get into government and they can get in without enormous expectations of spending, I sort of think that's probably the best we can hope for. Well, one can of the I... things I don't think we discussed enough, and I think I've been a, quite a critic of Rishi Sunak, but one of his best decisions, I think, was the cancellation of HS2. Mm. It was a brave decision. It was a project running way well out of control. They started it in the south when it should have been started in the north. It was going to be started at all. There's a lot of money to be saved in that. The Tories have their own proposal on how they're going to spend it on this new network north. I'm Most of which is in the south, from what we've seen so far. Yeah, they exaggerate just a little <laughs> bit, I think, there, Jackie. And I think it's very interesting. Labour have never come close to saying they're going to reverse that HS2 decision. I... And so there is some money there for a real levelling up investment. And that money, you're right to joke about the fact that some of this money is going to potholes in the south, etc. But actually, that money really can now go into investment in the north, you, um... rather than HS2, which was essentially going to suck growth towards London anyway. You, you touched on it by saying that, you know, you've been a bit of a critic of Rishi Sunak, and I did have to uh, pick up on that, I have to say. Uh, you're saying that you think it might be time for a change of Conservative Party leader now. I have, yeah. And that... Before the election? Before the election. Woof. Well, I think if you change the Prime Minister three times, why not change them a <laughs> fourth time? I think I did not want to change it. I thought Rishi Sunak deserved the chance to go to the election. But when you start hitting 18% in some opinion polls, when a budget, you give away £20 billion, it doesn't make a difference. When you have constant problems in the CCHQ operation, like the ridiculous ad that was produced on social media this week with the American voiceover attacking Sadiq Khan. It's week after week after week. I'm afraid Rishi Sunak, a really nice guy in my experience, just can't do politics. And I actually learned this week from an impeccable source. He's asking that question himself. He hasn't come to inclusion, but he's saying, am I good at politics? Am I part of the problem here? He is a human being that feels the pain of what the Conservative Party is going, just like any other, and I'm not saying he is going to resign or whatever, but he is not unaware of how his leadership hasn't really stabilised the Conservative position. In fact, our opinion poll rating is going down, and um, I think the May elections are going to be a yeah. very da crucial moment. Da Downing Street are furious with you for repeating the, the, that. It's not the first anecdote. time that they're furious They with say you've got an axe to grind. Um, I did not want Rishi Sunak to be leader of the Conservative Party, but... I basically, for a year, I've tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. But when you are hitting 18% in opinion polls, doing the thing, have they denied that what I yeah. said was happening is happening? Because I know my impeccable source is impeccable. I don't okay. think they've denied it to you, have they, Sophie? Uh, over to Downing Street. If you do want to talk about <laughs> them, the phone is here. Uh, they've said that they wouldn't be talking to you, that you've got an axe to grind. That's yeah. a line. Well, we'll find out if we get any more. Uh, and we'll have much more from you uh, on the programme. You want to see more of Tim's axe? <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> Jackie. <laughs> you haven't even got to the cocktails yet. <laughs> uh, a quarter of the important story now. An important quarter of the UK's population could see a huge jump in water bills. 40% because of a funding crisis at Thames Water. We touched on that in the interview with Keir Starmer. And Thames Water's boss has told Sky News that if the company doesn't get a fresh injection of capital soon, it could be overwhelmed by debts in excess of £18 billion. Now, that would trigger the regulator's special administration regime. In other words, nationalisation. Paul Calso has the details. For months, Thames Water has faced a sea of troubles. Thames Water has apologised for these ongoing issues. A poor record on leaks and on sewage contamination. The company was fined more than £32 million. We understand that our performance has not been good enough. Now Britain's biggest water company could become the largest failure of privatisation. 
A standoff between the company and regulator off what has seen shareholders pull the plug on a multi-billion pound investment and the boss scrambling to reassure customers it can stay afloat. We want to get to a business case that is in the best interests of customers. It is affordable for them, but it is also financeable for Thames Water and investable for our shareholders. Thames's problem is it's drowning in debt that it's struggling to afford. More than £15 billion has been piled onto the regulated company since privatisation, some of it funding investment in infrastructure, while bills actually remained relatively low. But £7 billion has been paid out in dividends to shareholders, almost £3 billion of that to Australian bank Macquarie in the 2010s. Now, the current owners, including British and Canadian pension funds and sovereign wealth funds, haven't taken an external dividend since they took control in 2017, but they do want a return on their investment at some point. And that now depends on the outcome of negotiations with the regulator off what. Thames says it needs to spend £20 billion upgrading pipes and sewers and it wants even more money from the shareholders to pay for it. They had agreed to provide £3.75 billion, starting with £500 million this month, but only if Thames agreed concessions with Offwatt, including putting up bills by 40% and lower fines for sewage spills. So far, Offwatt has refused, leaving the company, in its own words, uninvestable. Now, Thames says it's got enough money to trade until next May, but if it can't agree a deal that's attractive to investors, it will fall into special administration, effectively nationalisation. Privately, ministers are preparing for this, but publicly, they're blaming the company. Well, I think the leadership of Thames Water has been a disgrace. Um, I think for years now, uh, we've seen uh, the customers of Thames Water taken advantage of. The answer is not to hit the consumers. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And of course, the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. In Tooting, South London, residents would like the hole in the road fixed before they're asked to repair the finances. Quite upset and annoyed, actually, yeah, uh, because they don't seem to be providing a very good service at all at the moment. For the amount that they're charging at the moment, I don't think they, they should be putting it up because it's um, what we're already paying for is supposed to be for the sewage and for cleaning and making sure that everything is OK. And their shareholders are receiving dividends of ludicrous amounts of money. I don't really see what extra service we're getting for this 40% rise. The next few months will determine whether Thames and the privatised water model is beyond repair. Well, let's speak a little more to Paul, uh, shall we? And, Paul, it can feel that there's a bit of a standoff going on between off what and shareholders and the customer caught in the middle. That is the position. This is uh, its certainly a standoff. Uh, perhaps the best spin we could put on it is this is brinkmanship, maybe on both sides, the shareholders and the company on the one hand uh, seeking a hard deal out of off what. This, this is a standard regulatory process. Every five years, every water company goes through the negotiation Thames is in the middle of. At the moment, Thames wants to put up bills and it wants to keep the fines for all that sewage going into rivers down. Its investors ultimately want to pull out uh, some kind of return for the money they've got locked up in there. Uh, on the other side, off what, which has got a commitment to protect environmental and consumer standards, but it's also got to allow companies to make a return that allows them to give us the water industry we all need, both clean water and waste. Uh, so the regulator is in the middle of it. Whether, uh, whether this is a, a just a, a, a bump in the road on those negotiations, I'm not sure. I think uh, you have to ask the question, if these investors who've been in since 2017 and not taken any money out yet, if they don't want to invest, are there any other... Who, who wants to buy a water company today, uh, given this position? This, I find the political position today interesting as well. So yesterday, you'll recall, we had the publication of record sewage spills right across the country, and politicians were, in some cases, almost actually running to riverbanks uh, to speak to the cameras about how awful this was. Today, everyone much more guarded when it comes to what do you do about a massive company with 25% of the UK population relying on its water, £18 billion of debt... What do you do about that? Because the alternatives to somehow scrambling a deal together that makes this privatised model work and keep going is that you take it into public ownership. And that debt has to go somewhere. There's new legislation which might allow the debt to stay off the public books, but that would surely be contested. If you did that and you said to other potential investors, come and invest in our utilities, hey, perhaps in our new national grid, 
but if we don't like it, we might just uh, dump you with the debt if it goes wrong. That's a really difficult position to put to investors. So I think perhaps the most, uh, perhaps the most instructive thing today, certainly politically said by the chief executive of of, uh, of uh, Thames, forgive me, was that they've got enough money, whatever happens, to keep going till next May. Crucially, that's definitely the other side of an election. Uh, so this might not be the current government's problem, but it is absolutely a problem for administrations going forward. How do we make this system work when the political imperatives, the salience of sewage has risen so high and people are no longer so worried about keeping bills down, but they want rivers cleaned up? Doing that is going to cost billions and take decades. Paul, thank you very much indeed. Paul Calce speaking to us now. OK, just have some breaking news to bring you that's coming through to us now, because South Africa's Department of Transport has confirmed in a statement that there's been a bus crash in the northern province of Limpopo, which resulted in at least 45 deaths and one person seriously injured. You look at those uh, pictures there. The ministry claimed the driver lost control and collided with barriers on the bridge, which caused the bus to go over the bridge and hit the ground where it caught fire. That's according to the statement. Well, rescue operations are continuing this evening. We'll bring you more on the breaking story as we get it. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up. Should water companies be nationalised? We'll hear from Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Hay and get her thoughts on how Labour would save councils struggling to keep their heads above water. And I get the thought of Conservative Party Chair Richard Holden on whether the Conservatives should be offering reform big hitter Nigel Farage a plush post-election posting. But also ahead, we had a little insight today into Angela Rayner's favourite cocktail, Venom, and we're going to recreate it live on The Politics Hub. What could possibly go wrong? Stay with us. your Sunday mornings covered. From the front page and the sounds of the streets to the voices of the people who make the major calls and big picture politics beyond Westminster. We'll put you at the heart of our story. A new start to Sunday. I'm ready. Are you? Join me, Trevor Phillips, Sunday mornings on Sky News. I'm Martha Kellner and I'm Sky's US correspondent based here in Los Angeles. We aim to be the best and the most trusted place for news. I'm Martin Brunt and I'm Sky's crime correspondent. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent and I'm based here in Beijing. We help you understand the world with us. I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Welcome back. Well, today, Keir Starmer parked his tanks all over the Conservative Party's levelling up agenda. So what's their next move? I spoke to the Conservative Party chair and MP for North West Durham, Richard Holden, and I asked him about Keir Starmer's claim that Rishi Sunak has strangled levelling up at birth. 
Well, what I'd say is that over the last uh, 14 years, we've actually delivered devolution in England, something which Labour failed to do over their 14 years in office. That's delivering huge amounts of spending power to fantastic mayors up and down the country, like Ben Houchen. You can see what levelling up actually looks like in Teesside with what he's doing there, to Andy Street in the West Midlands, also bringing billions of overseas investment in. That's what levelling up looks like. And I think you can see that in stark contrast to what Labour are actually doing in government. Uh, in Wales, uh, that's uh, uh, not going that well. It sees as a blueprint for the rest of the country, yet they've got far higher um, rates uh, in the NHS, people uh, waiting times. They've got uh, far lower school performance, something which has been transformed in England over the last okay. 14 years. That's something that's really levelled up. Uh, with okay. uh, two-thirds of kids in 2010 attending good or outstanding schools, that's now over 90% in England, transformed educational performance. I do think, you know, right I'm going to, can I, can I jump in and get a question in as well? I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, look, some, I think some council leaders would be listening to what you've got to say there uh, with uh, open ears, shall we say, and a few raised eyebrows, uh, because there is a four billion pound funding gap, many will say, uh, with uh, council uh, leaders. Only 10% of the funding that was earmarked for levelling up projects has been spent, according to the Public Accounts Committee. You know, there's a huge squeeze uh, on regional spending. Uh, no, that's just not the case, right? When you look at, um, at what we've done in terms of investing in, uh, for example, in the police right across the country, uh, we're seeing record numbers in many police forces right up and down what the country. What did I say I'm there hearing... that wasn't the case? Because I wasn't talking about um, the police, I'm talking about council money and the funding for levelling up projects, so what wasn't the case? And, uh, well, in terms of levelling up projects, I mean, that's a very specific thing about very specific uh, levelling up bids, right? And uh, I want to see as much of that money out the door as quickly as possible uh, as well. Uh, and a lot of that is already gone there. Some of it is being uh, still worked through. But levelling up just isn't about levelling up project specifically. It's also about what we're doing in education or employment right across the country. It's also about those big devolution deals that we're doing right across the country, putting you cash can't into say, you, you can't say uh, that that's no, not the case, what I just said, though. The Public Accounts Committee said that only 10% of funding earmarked <laughs> for levelling up projects has been spent, and councils uh, what said, what, are what, what, really what, worried about funding gap. Those things are both true. But what I'd say to that, Sophie, is that uh, those levelling up projects are only a part of that overall levelling up agenda that we're doing right across the country. You're talking about one pot of cash. And actually, when we're talking about levelling up, I'm talking about things like education as well. Huge amounts of cash across the country spent on education. We've transformed education opportunities for children right up and down the country. I'd also say I'm talking about employment and people on lower wages. If you're in the north of England, uh, like in my constituency or here in the northwest where I am today, there's many more people in lower paid jobs. Actually, since 2010, they've seen uh, their taxes cut and their wages rise 30% uh, in real terms uh, by uh, today, the standards that we're seeing now. That's a huge pay increase for people. That is levelling up in action, uh, not just for areas, but for individuals and their families as well. Uh, of course, I want to see more cash out the door as quickly uh, as possible uh, with specific projects getting the go-ahead. I think that's incredibly important. But levelling up uh, funding specifically uh, is only a part of that broad panoply of levelling up funding, okay. which we're doing right across all government departments, not just from specific projects coming out of uh, uh, one of them. Um, levelling up is clearly a big reason, as you'll know, uh, why many voters went for Boris Johnson back in 2019. You're looking at the polls now and you can see why some of your colleagues are a bit twitchy. Uh, there's a suggestion uh, in Politico uh, this evening uh, that some of them are saying that the PM should try and buy off Nigel Farage uh, and the threat of reform by offering a plum job ambassador to Washington, something like that. Would that be a good idea? Uh, look, uh, I'm out on the ground campaigning. I've been party chairman for a, a good few months now. I'm campaigning right across the country all the time. Uh, what I'd say is that, and it's, this is clear to me on the doorstep every time I'm out, that people are saying they know that the choice of the next general election is going to be between a, a Conservative government led by Rishi Sunak or a Labour government led by Keir Starmer. There is no uh, doubt about that. They're the only two uh, possible outcomes. Uh, I think that we've got a strong record on uh, improving education. That's uh, one of the things I've talked about already, but also in terms of vocational uh, education and apprenticeships, a very strong record there uh, as well. Now you can get 70% of jobs and careers access to... I just want to steer you back to the question, because I, uh, I have allowed you to uh, you know, get your point, your campaigning points across. I just want to steer you back to the question, which was about Nigel Farage. Do you think it would be a good idea for the Prime Minister to do a deal with Nigel Farage? 
Look, I mean, what Nigel Farage does and the Reform Party is totally up to them. Uh, at the, we saw recently the Rochdale by-election that, uh, compared to the last general election, actually the vote for the Brexit Party slash Reform Party uh, slash UKIP, I mean, I don't, I can't always remember which they are at the moment, they, they actually went backwards. It, we've, we've not seen them achieve more than uh, 13%, even in the by-elections we've had uh, recently. It's quite clear that a vote for reform, all it's going to do is help Keir Starmer get into Downing Street. Uh, so that's, not a good idea the, to offer him a job then. Uh, all, all I would say is that it's irrelevant to what people are talking about on the ground. What they're interested in is their lives, the, what's happening in their communities. Uh, what they want to see is the Conservative Party uh, working together, united, delivering, as we have done since 2010, uh, on the people's priorities, such as uh, now putting tax for the future. We're looking at national insurance cuts already hitting people's pay packets. We've got the second one of those hitting people's pay packets now. That's putting £900 okay. a year into the pockets of your uh, average worker. And at the same time, over that 14 years, we've also introduced a triple lock on pensions. So people who've worked now, hard... Again, well, we've got the list. Awesome. We've got the list. Um, why don't you, you know, direct people to your... Uh, website or something like that and if you want, they want to find out more of the list of achievements they can absolutely do that full credit for trying to cram as many into this interview though I do uh, really admire that I have to say I want to talk to you if I may about water companies uh, because Thames Water is in crisis 15 billion pounds of debt telling Sky News they might have to increase bills by 40 percent and this isn't just an issue about Thames Water it's a national issue uh, with water companies increasing bills pouring sewage uh, into uh, rivers uh, and um, seas as well what are you going to do about Thames Water? Look, I, I, think it's, I think I shouldn't comment on a specific company, but I can speak about our broader plan for water across the piece. That's £2.2 .2 billion of investment going in. Also, unlimited fines now, which we've legislated for, uh, for people uh, who are polluting. Uh, and I'd just say, look, when we started in 2010, 7% of rivers and outflows uh, were monitored. That is now 100%. Uh, when you see that across England and what we've done in terms of looking at that, this is why we know the situation we're facing. And we also know uh, that over in Wales, which is run by the uh, Labour Party for, for the last 25 years, uh, they're looking at double the number of discharges uh, per head as we're seeing uh, in England. So I think that's an important uh, difference uh, there. We're I taking know you, action... I know you don't want to talk that, about specifics, um, but there has, of course, been talk about Thames Water even needing to be nationalised. Of course, it was Margaret Thatcher who originally privatised the water companies. Would you say that's been a success? Uh, what I'd say is that you've seen since uh, 2010 uh, us actually starting to monitor the situation. You can't improve things unless you're monitoring the situation. Uh, that's what we're doing now, so you can actually see the issues at stake. We're ensuring that £2.2 .2 billion is invested. For those companies who aren't acting, we're, we're stopping dividends uh, for shareholders. We're also allowing unlimited fines. We've had £130 million of the fines now for water companies. I want to see them acting further and quicker. Um, and uh, But you can only do that if you've got a full understanding and acknowledgement of the situation, the which question, is what we have. The question was about privatisation of the water companies and nationalisation. And I just think there's a really interesting point to be made here. Because have we got full privatisation anyway in the competition that comes with that? You know, I'm a Thames Water customer, but if I don't agree with their service or I don't like the fact that they're hiking bills, I can't just say, oh, no, I'm not going to go with Thames Water anymore. I'm going to switch companies. So has privatisation of the water companies worked? Well, look, it's a highly regulated sector, and that's because it's uh, essentially a privatised uh, monopoly, which is why it's so heavily regulated, which is why we're doing things which we wouldn't do with other companies, such as uh, totally monitoring everything they now do, uh, ability to stop them paying dividends, which we wouldn't do with other private companies, uh, ability to issue unlimited fines, which we wouldn't do with other sectors. That's why it's a highly regulated sector. What I'd say is that uh, I don't think that when you look at other parts of the world, other parts of the UK, uh, which don't have the exactly the same system that you see uh, a, a, a vastly a different outcome. And what I want to do is see actually improvements being made. That's why we've got our plan for water. Um, that's why we're holding these companies uh, to account in order to deliver that. Because I want to see as, as having as stopping these uh, outflows and uh, that sort of thing uh, from occurring in the future uh, because of the impact it has on people's okay. lives uh, and on our environment. Uh, but we can only do that from a position where we know exactly what's going on. Uh, that's what we've delivered in government alongside a regulatory regime in order to enforce that as well. OK, thank you very much indeed. Uh, good to talk to you on the programme tonight, Richard Holden. Thanks, Sophie.
Rich Holden speaking to me there. Coming up next on The Politics Hub. What exactly should happen to water company bosses who fail their customers? We'll hear from Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Hay. And we'll ask our duo whether Thatcher's privatisation has failed. Plus, we had a little insight into Angela Rayner's cocktail of choice and why you might do well to avoid any offering of it at her parties. Stay with us. Hello, welcome back. Well, we've been talking about the crisis at Thames Water. A little earlier, I spoke to the Shadow Transport Secretary, Louise Hay, who spoke to us from her constituency in Sheffield and tried to find out what she had to say about the current issues with the company. Thames Water currently in crisis. There's even talk of a 40% hike in bills. Should nationalisation be on the table? Well, look. We don't have the time or, frankly, the money to be nationalising um, water companies right now because it would take far too long to unpick the very complex regulatory and, and privatised system that we have before we saw any impact on bills or on investment in infrastructure. That is why Steve Reid, the Shadow Environment Secretary, has been setting out plans for many months and calling on the government to be much tougher on regulation. It is the Tories' regulatory system that has allowed companies like Thames Water to get into huge amounts of debt 
whilst not investing in the infrastructure that we need and illegally dumping sewage in our rivers and lakes. That's why we've set out plans to put proper sanctions on water bosses that do this and indeed criminal sanctions in the worst cases and to radically reform the regulatory system to put financial stability at its heart. Um, we want to see water companies investing in infrastructure and putting consumers first and we want to see the government, hopefully the next Labour government, properly cracking down on the illegal dumping of sewage in our rivers, lakes and seas. OK, thank you very much indeed. Louise Hay there for the Labour Party. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Well, let's bring Jackie and Tim back in, uh, shall we? Um, Tim, to you first. What do you think about the current state of the water industry? Well, look, you get water out of the tap in Britain and it's high quality. I never buy bottled water. And I think we take that for granted. There's lots of countries in the world, including Europe, where actually the quality isn't good. The monitoring standards that are now in place from the government are very high, probably some of the highest in Europe, and the water is being cleaned up. There is now a plan to do it. It's clearly not at the pace most people would like, and there is still clearly a problem. The trouble with changing the regulatory regime and bringing it into the public sector is then the water industry will be in a queue with the NHS, with public sector pay, and what we know from the history of nationalised industries is the investment isn't put in. So it's not an ideal system with the likes of Thames Water, but I think we need to improve the regulatory regime so that we get the investment from the private sector rather than bring it into the state, because the history of state ownership is not a good one. And that's exactly what Lou said. You know, you, you, you offered her the chance to do what some might have thought a Labour politician would do and to say, oh, nationalisation is the answer. But actually, no. She said, we need to strengthen the regulation, re regulatory regime in the same way as Tim suggesting. Yeah. The problem here is, you know, we heard Michael Gove earlier on sort of somehow or another being a champion of the consumer. The problem is Michael Gove is part of the government that allowed the regulatory regime to fail in the way in which it has. It's interesting that he felt the need to intervene in the way in which he did because he knows that water is now becoming symbolic of the sort of broken Britain and all the things that aren't working. You can't, mm. you know, you can't have the boat race because people might get poisoned by the water in the Thames, uh, you know, uh, we can see that people are earning enormous amounts of money in terms of bonuses for failure, failure to deliver. It's a sort of um, microcosm of what's mm. wrong with Tory Britain. So is, you both agree on the nationalisation uh, debate. Lou Hay agrees on it as well. But I'm sure there'll be people right now screaming at the television saying, look at the state of the water industry, look at the bills people are facing, mm. look at the stake of the rivers, look at the money that shareholders have creamed off and say, absolutely we should renationalise the water industry. Um, and yes, it's going to be expensive, and yes, it's going to be difficult, and yes, it's going to take time, but isn't this exactly the kind of long-term decision-making mm. that we should be looking at? Ideally, but, you know, your interview two weeks ago with Keir, Sophie, Beth's tonight, he won't promise to put money into the National Health Service of any new scale. He won't put, promise to put money into policing. Do you really think he's going to start putting, if we nationalise, long-term money into water rather than those frontline services. Because, well, he... unfortunately, public services are judged on what... Sorry, politicians are judged on what they do in a few years. He... This is a 10 years, 15-year programme. But this is the thing, isn't it? He won't agree to it because, as you say, it's a 10 to 15-year, billions of pounds uh, programme. Rishi Sunak won't agree to it, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not the right thing to do, what would you say? But the, and the real challenge is that the water industry does need more investment. I mean, you know, it needs yeah. to answer the questions about how it's built up such enormous debt and failed to deliver the improvements it should have done, but it does need more investment. And that's why you've now got the challenge for politicians of having to say, well, do you think that off what should allow there to be increases in prices? That's a really difficult place for any politician to be, which is why you've seen both Michael Gove say, no, that's obviously wrong. Yeah. And you've seen Keir Starmer in the interview earlier on saying, well, of course, it's for this government to decide. We'll have to think about it when we get into mm. government, because this is a really tricky political issue. Yeah. But the question really isn't, do we want to put money and more money into water? Of course we do. The question is, do you want to put more money into water at the expense of investing in our police service or building new hospitals or relieving the tax burden on families who are already struggling? That's why politics, in a time of low growth, is so difficult. Yeah. OK. Um, and in a cost-of-living uh, election, you also don't want to be in the position where you're saying you're going to have to pay more for your water bills in order to yeah. not have poo in your river. <laughs> well, well, yeah, it was technical term. Yeah, it's good to say, yeah. <laughs> uh, Thanks both very much, uh, indeed. Uh, nothing to say uh, on whatever we have in our rivers. Um, now...
coming up, and we are looking forward to this one, I have to say. Why Angela Rayner's party guests might be well advised to avoid the punch bowl. Coming up on the UK tonight at 8 o'clock, the shocking video that lays bare the UK's knife crime epidemic. A teenager has been arrested on suspicion of attempted murder, and a man is in a critical condition after a stabbing in broad daylight on a train in South London. We'll discuss what is going on on the UK streets and how we fix it. That's the UK tonight at 8 o'clock. This will require mountaineering skills. Beaks come in useful as ice picks. And tobogganing is a quick way down. We'll have the pleasure of curating them in this for this album that, that, that Dolby commissioned, Seven Sonic Wonders. And so I wanted to include sounds from across the planet, from, from a glacier in Iceland, right down to uh, the sounds of a frog chorus in the tropical parts of Panama, but also sounds closer to home, starlings, a great murmuration of birds, the Ring Angels track. So it was difficult to choose seven tracks, but I wanted to give a sort of wide geographical range. And also sounds that I just found astonishing, as well as sounds that we need to consider as regards um, protecting the, the habitats in which they happen. about the whale signs? Well, I think that they're humpback whales and they're singing on their migration route down the North Atlantic to the Silver Bank. And what I found fascinating about that is that not only the songs of the whales themselves, but the acoustic of their environment, I heard for the first time this remarkable cathedral-like space around the, uh, around the whales. And that's something I wanted to include. And that's the thing that, that Dolby Atmos does. It spatializes the sound so I can take the listener to where my microphones, or hydrophones were in this case, when I, when I made the recordings. Well, just conventional microphones like the ones that we're using now, but, um, but also for the whales, underwater microphones, which are called hydrophones. Uh, and sometimes I'm really interested in putting, like the microphones I'm wearing now, and, and you, you've got on, these tiny personal microphones. And I often think there are much more interesting places to put those microphones other than on people sometimes, because it allows you to get them into these magical spaces and tune into the natural world in a way that we rarely get the opportunity of hearing. Hello, welcome back to the Politics Bar Hub and welcome back what is soon to be <laughs> our cocktail bar. Now, there's a list of things you should never do on live TV, work with children or animals, eat a bacon sandwich. Well, how about drink a cocktail nicknamed Venom because of its potency. <laughs> On the politics half, we like to push the boundaries. And when Labour leader, deputy leader, I should say, Angela Rayner, gave us a little insight into her favourite evening aperitif, we thought we should give it a go in the name of journalistic research, of course. Of course. Here is what happened earlier. I'm delighted and proud to be joined in this crusade by our leader and the man who does always get his round in. <laughs> I give you our leader, future Prime Minister, Keir Starmer. Some advice for all of you, if you're thinking of getting in a round with Ange, don't be tempted by her favourite drink, the Venom cocktail, or you'll live to regret it. <laughs> and here it is, the Venom cocktail uh, in all its green... Glory, I'm going to hand one out to each of us. Thank you. And I'm also... It looks disgusting. Yeah. It looks... I'm also going to get some uh, of uh, the greatest uh, glass of Thames water as well, <laughs> uh, just to make sure <laughs> we're very health and safety uh, conscious on the programme as well. Yeah. So here is a Venom cocktail. Now, before we try it and give you a verdict, I just want to read you the list of the ingredients, because this is quite something. Here we go. A Venom contains a bottle of vodka, a bottle. A bottle of Southern Comfort, mm -hmm. 10 bottles of blue WKD and a litre of orange juice. Um, 
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it the a... The orange juice is good for you. Cheers. You know, it doesn't smell too bad. Uh -oh. <laughs> That's a I, I can't ever thumbs, resist thumbs, a thumbs. cocktail. Can I? If you got Beth, one, oh, you this is strong. This is never, strong. I would never allow us to make up right. a cocktail and not invite. See you. Well, I'm such, I'm such a gay crush when it comes <laughs> to the as well. Cheers. You know what? Cheers. It's not as bad as I thought. It was. Oh, hang on, it's hitting me now. It's hitting me a little bit now, I have to say. Do you want to see? <laughs> more of a champagne socialist myself, but cheers, it's Ange. good. <laughs> it's Angela's birthday today as well, so mm. maybe she's Happy had birthday. a few of these. I'm not sure. Is it good? I feel like it's one of those things where it tastes surprisingly OK, and then it's actually it's starting to... It's... Jackie and I are little members of a cross-party group called the Martini Club, so yeah. I think we should invite um, Angela along and maybe we should test the... Uh, Again, would, would, would a venom make it to the martini club mm. then? It's not as good as the well, martinis after, that Jackie makes, I can tell you. After a couple of martinis, we might then move on to the venom. <laughs> 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 so, what's your favourite cocktail? Um, I'm a bit of a glass of red wine girl. I'm a bit of a lightweight, to be honest. Oh, I mean, God. honestly, I've taken two sips of Get the woman already... cab home then after two <laughs> sips of venom. I'm a bit worried. <laughs> I'm not sure I'd make it for an evening with Angela Rayner. not bad. <laughs> what about you? What about you, Beth? I actually last weekend made my first ever dirty martini. Ah. And I might make another one when I get home tonight <laughs> after travelling to Dudley and back this uh, you need today. A, you need a venom to, uh, <laughs> to get over the week, definitely. Um, Angela Rayner, as such, the, the uh, Labour Party, what do you think, Tim? I generally think she is. I think she's gone into a little bit of pickle over this uh, housing issue. But generally, I think she's a charismatic person. She talks in a way so few other politicians do. And I know Tory MPs slightly worry about her potency on the doorstep. Mm. She's, a, she's a straight talk in a way we don't have them. But she's got to get through this um, tax issue. I think that's the reason why she's being targeted with this, actually, because mm. people know that she's got a fantastic backstory, you know, yeah. her experience of coming from being a care worker through the trade union movement, mm. the way, as Tim says, that she's able to communicate with people mm. makes her a real strength for Labour. What do you reckon? Well, she, uh, it was interesting today because it was awkward at uh, the launch because Keir Starmer was on stage, Angela Rayner was in the front row and there were repeated questions about Angela Rayner while she couldn't answer for herself. Yeah. And actually, Keir Starmer was very fulsome, very fulsome, in his defence for her, yeah. there hasn't... They've been a bit bumpy at times. No. But, 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 Beth, he didn't say he'd read personally that tax true. report, which anyway, was keeping his is, distance. Let's stick slightly. to the Venom cocktails mm. for a minute. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we did get a uh, message from Angela Rayner, uh, I should say, uh, who messaged to say, uh, when she heard we were making these uh, comment cocktails, she messaged to say, I hope you remember the orange, which we have, don't worry. <laughs> We've got the orange on the side of the glass, very classy, mm -hmm. and the orange juice uh, in here as well. Feels like this is what we need as we kind of head into the long uh, Easter weekend. <laughs> that is it from us tonight. <laughs> uh, we're all going to be continuing, potentially. I'm not is sure it, if I'm going to make it to the end of this. A call from Ofcom. Is a call from Ofcom. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you later. Up next, so it's the UK Tonight with Sarah Jamie. Cheers. <laughs>